afternoon. On behalf of the Atlanta VA Healthcare System, and on behalf of our chaplain service, we are grateful, grateful that you have decided to take a moment to join us as we gather on this Good Friday. This is the day that Christians or followers of Christ commemorate the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. Now, although today is referred to as a Good Friday, it is indeed a very solemn day. Often it is observed with fasting and reflections on those words that are spoken, have been spoken from the cross by Jesus. For Christians, it is the most important day, the most crucial day of the Christian year, because it celebrates what we believe to be the most pivotal day in the history of the world. Jesus willingly suffered and died as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. It is called Good Friday because he became the final, complete sacrifice for each of our sins. We couldn't have erased our sins ourselves. So on this Good Friday, we ask that you would enter with us into this commemoration. Call to worship. Let all who would serve Christ gather for worship this day. For Christ gave us a new covenant that all may have a life. Through the cross, Christ has made full the law forever. Yet, Yet we are not without God's laws, nor without the Holy Spirit. In Christ, God has written the law of love forever on our hearts, all blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Mighty and merciful God, we pause as a community to remember your sacrificial love. It's shown light into the darkness that more light from such emptiness, that revealed hope out of devastation, that spoke truth through incrimination, that released freedom in spite of imprisonment, and brought us forgiveness instead of punishment. We ask that you would teach us to mourn, for your word is true. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Don't let us rush to Easter Sunday too quickly. Yeah. Give us grace to linger here in the place where sorrow meets redemption. Make your death as real to us as your resurrection. Keep us near the cross. And as we wait at the foot of the cross, God, reveal to us again the costliness of sin. Remind us that your all-consuming grace came at, highest, it came at the highest price. Fill us with the joy and sorrow and reverence and gratitude that befit a good Friday service. Joy for your victory. Sorrow for your death, reverence for your holiness, gratitude for your grace. Thank you that we can now walk in the light of your life. Yeah. Hope, truth, freedom, and forgiveness. This day and every day, in the name of Jesus, we say amen. 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 Let's stand and first word that comes from Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Behold the horror. 
crucifixion, this older form of the electric chair. Behold this man innocent, whose love for life and God were so revolutionary, so inclusive, so liberty, liberating, that the pastors and politicians and power brokers of the day conspired against him. Behold this man now, innocent and naked before a mob, hurling insults. Innocent and immobile before the police, who are standing idly and quiet by. Innocent and hanging before his family, who are powerless to do anything. In some ways, this might not be an extraordinary story, but just an ordinary one. Another day in the headlines. Another body snuffed out by the cruelty of this world. Like George Floyd, mm. Breonna Taylor, mm. Elijah McClain. Mm. Some names from the Atlanta shooting, Soon Joon Park, mm. Him Joon Jong Grant, Soon Cha Kim. And the loved ones. Oh, the loved ones we lost to COVID-19. Can you feel the anger rising? The grief in your throats? Your heart splitting open? Or maybe just the numbness? All of these feelings and sensations are behind and in and with these words, Father, forgive. I am struck, though, that the words, at the words that Jesus chose not to say. Jesus did not say, I forgive you. Rather, Jesus turns his pain, his hurt and betrayal, and gives it to God and says, Father, could you forgive with me and for me? At another hospital in Atlanta, I remember being called to speak with a social worker in the chapel. She was feeling guilty and confused, for her sister had been brutally murdered in a hotel room nine months previous, and she was about to go to her murderer's court trial. Being a good Christian, she said, I need to forgive him, but right now I can't. And I could sense from her composure that she was trying to do what was mentally right, but her body gave her another truth. Her body wouldn't allow her to cheaply forgive, which I think reveals the heart of forgiveness. No one can forgive on one's own strength. We need God to do what is divine. Whether this was helpful or not, I'm not sure, but I told her, for right now, I would forgive him with you so that at least one person extends forgiveness. But the hope of this gesture and holding this forgiveness was that one day, just one day, she would arrive at it too. But not cheaply and not yet until God did the work for her. So I wonder if Jesus is doing something similar here. Before he dies, he gives to God what he cannot handle alone. God, forgive with me. God, forgive for me. And this reveals to me the mystery of the heart of God. One person alone cannot forgive, but a community can, in struggle in tears, in prayer. The community of God, the Trinity, Father and Son, connected to the Spirit, do forgive together the burdens affecting the one, the horrors of the world, and the horrors of those who, like us, do not know what we do. Could we join with Christ, cry right now, and ask God to do the impossible, the impossible, Help us forgive God as you forgive.
second word comes from Luke 23 and 43. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thought for your consideration. It is not too late. It is not too late. After responding to humanity collectively in a statement of forgiveness, we see two thieves alongside Jesus on the cross. Jesus in the center, one on the left and one on the right. Not as a balance to the equity or justice of life, but a contrast to the ability of God to manifest possibilities in a sometimes seemingly impossible situation. As they hung, while the crowds mocked, fervently assaulted, and laughed, Scripture gives us evidence in parallel readings of Mark and Matthew that the criminals who were crucified uh, with Jesus joined in with the soldiers and began to mock Jesus. And as they spoke and they questioned him, if you are the Christ you claim to be, save yourself in us. So listen, Jesus has not changed his position. He does, he does not spiritually lower his standards. He does not lay his religion down. He does not change his stripes. Jesus is not concerned with peer pressure, political baby, or self-promotion. He knows who he is, and he knows what he came to do. Can I suggest that if sometimes we would be who God called us to be, Steadfast, unmoved, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen. Peacemakers. Then it allows God's grace and mercy to transform others to what God wants them to be. <laughs> in the midst of it, when things are going wrong and it, and it doesn't seem right, it seems like you're getting the short end of the stick, God is calling us to stand. Because perhaps it's not, perhaps it's not about you, but he's working on somebody else. Amen giving them opportunity. And that's exactly what happened next. Mm. Something rose up in the other criminal mm. and gave an appeal. He said, don't, don't, don't you fear God? Well, listen, we are here because of the things we have done. Mm. But this man is innocent. He's done no wrong. And he asks, Jesus, remember me when you come into paradise makes me wonder. How is it that we have developed such exclusionary language instead of inclusion? Why do we work so hard to keep others out from, from having access? Many work overtime and deny access to health care, education, a survivable wage. I'm thankful Jesus did not say, you made your bed, now lay it. Yeah. Access denied, justice denied, respect denied, human decency denied, you don't have enough money denied. You don't have enough influential friends denied. Not enough education denied. Instead, Jesus answered, today, yeah. <laughs> you will be with me in paradise. Mm. What a powerfully penetrating word spoken by Jesus in Calvary. Words spoken to the height of humiliation and the depth of despair. Words of assurance that reveal the character of God, revisits relationships, and ushers in reassurance in the midst of storms and uncertainty. Christ's promise is not towards just the thief on the cross, but it's toward me. It's toward you. His words remind us it's not too late. It's not too late for God to manifest possibilities in sometimes seemingly impossible situations. It may appear that you're at the end of the line, the clock is run out. Jesus is saying that all things are possible with me. It's not too late to have a change of heart. For the one criminal continued to mock and deride, but the other ones had a change of heart. So what am I saying? I'm saying don't let pride, don't let prejudice, don't let pride history keep you from seeing differently and asking Jesus to remember you. It's not too late. There is still time to repent and ask for forgiveness. It's not too late. Jesus tells us today, immediately, now, not tomorrow, not in a hundred years, not in a thousand years, not in a million years, not after the rapture, before the millennium. Today, immediately, today, you will be with me. 
Listen, God knows your name. Yeah. And he assures us that we'll never be alone in paradise. Mm. What a perpetual person of our promise. No more sickness, yeah. no more worry. Yeah. Because God wipes away all our tears. Mm. Immediate personal promise. Listen, it's not too late. Today, you can be with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friendship and family is 
the antidote for loneliness. Jesus brought two people together who had gathered around the cross, showing that from the cross flows peace, bringing together God's people as family. If we draw close to the cross like Mary, he will bring us into close family relations with other believers. He will bring us together with others who are like-minded, who draw close to the cross, so that we can serve the Lord together. By this saying, Jesus revealed God's provision for a lonely and broken heart. He knew what Mary was going through. What Jesus did for Mary, he wants to do for all. God wants to heal your heart. Mm. Which in Aramaic means 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus called out to the Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He fulfilled the prophetic statement from Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Jesus, who is fully God, yet is fully human, in his humanity while on earth, expressed his sense of abandonment as God the Father placed the sins of the world, our sins, upon him. While Jesus was fully God in the flesh while here on earth, what he communicated and experienced for a brief moment is what we experience outside of Christ, which is separation. Jesus allowed himself to be separated from God for that very moment as he took and bore our sins. He took on and felt the weight of sin upon him so that you and I may have life. If you know Jesus as you've received his free gift of salvation, then you need to remember that he will never leave or forsake you. If you've ever felt forsaken, rejected, or abandoned, may you remember what Jesus endured for you, as it will likely change your perspective on your own circumstances. Mm -hmm. Let all of this sink in for a moment, and what may we pause in thanksgiving, gratitude, and worship as we reflect on his ultimate sacrifice for us and our salvation. Imagine a young man in the ICU. He's the only son, and he has a father. And the father is not able to enter the room due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, the global pandemic. There was a greater separation than that on the cross. So please, remember with me. Remember and reflect upon the cross. The message of the cross that there was a great exchange where the separated were together again. Mm. Amen. 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 The fifth word, I thirst. John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. This is the shortest, yet perhaps the most difficult, of all the sayings of Christ. Scholars have long struggled to understand what Jesus was referring to, what Jesus was communicating when he said, I thirst. Jesus, like all Jews in that day and time, was Hebrew. Jesus spoke Aramaic. And though there were other languages being spoken in those days, such as Latin and Greek, Jesus, though, spoke Aramaic, which was very difficult for first century interpreters or scribes to interpret. Many of the words Jesus spoke were not found in first century Aramaic. Just as some of the language we use in my day, in my young days, may not be found in encyclopedia mm -hmm. or <laughs> We would say, are you coming by the crib? <laughs> Surely we didn't mean that we tell the baby. Right. Just, are you coming by the house? <laughs> Sometimes we'd say, what's happening? Uh -huh. We really didn't want a detailed description of your day. Right. <laughs> we were just saying hello. <laughs> Those, those interpretations won't be found in your modern dictionaries. Mm -hmm. However, scholars won't find these traditions, these interpretations in their modern references. I, as a scholar, would like to offer a new interpretation of this saying, mm -hmm. I thirst. Given the context clues and Jesus' situation at the time, I report that Jesus was saying, I long to go home. 
Father, I'm coming home. Just as George Floyd cried out to his mother, letting her know that he was on his way home, he was coming home to be with his mother. Therefore, I purport that when Jesus said, I thought, I thirst not just for water, wine, or vinegar, but to be reunited with his Father or to be reunited as God. Jesus was fully human, and he was actively dying. Surely, with a crown of thorns on his head, he bled. With a hole pierced in his side, he bled blood and water. With nails in his hands and feet, he bled. And surely he thirsts for water to quench his depleted body. But I say, he may also have thirst for more than just water. But he thirsts and longed for going home. Jesus knowing after his work had been done, after all the healing of the sick and the raising of the dead and the calming of the sea, the changing of the water to wine, the catching of loaves of fish. After all these miracles had been performed, Jesus knew that these things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst to go home. A song comes to mind. Coming. Coming home, oh, coming, coming home, my Lord, nevermore to Rome. Picture Jesus, picture Jesus. single one of us and it is a singular act 
of reconciliation once and for all for the benefit of sinners like me. Yeah. What it is finished is declaring is that man is no longer having to pay the penalty for the sins as long as he accepts the gift of salvation. It, it's not for sale. It's, it, it's not to be bartered. Uh, there's nothing you can do to earn it. In fact, the prophet Isaiah is clear in chapter 64, verse 6, that all of our righteous works are even, and even the bad ones are as filthy rags. Salvation is free, totally free. Yeah. Free 99 even <laughs> is free. Uh, now I know my, my time is short, but before I can take my seat, I, I can't do that without sharing with you that uh, these three words in one, uh -huh. some of y'all will catch that later, yeah. they, they hold a precious promise for those who claim, lay claim to the propitiation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It, it may seem that he's still working things out for your good, but remember, Jesus has declared it is finished. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the heavy lifting happened on the hill called Golgotha yeah. by the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Where my Savior and yours, the original rock, long before Dwayne Johnson, yeah. laid the smack down on that old Beelzebub. Yeah. He snuffed out the dragon's fire for the redeemed of the Lord. When the, when the phrase, it is finished, Jesus snatched the teeth out of the mouth of that old roaring lion. Yeah. So now the only thing he can do is make noise. The Messiah took the punishment that we deserved. Then less than three days later, snatched the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Yeah. Jesus finished the job so that we didn't have to wonder about our salvation. Mm. We can have blessed assurance that no matter the circumstances or the weaknesses of our flesh, his grace is sufficient. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. I want to encourage you today that regardless of how you may feel, Jesus sealed the deal about 2,000 years ago yeah. when he made the perfect, passive, indicative, singular statement to tell us day, mm. it is finished. Today I want to encourage you to believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our final word can be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 46. Mm. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Over this past year, we all have suffered through this pandemic. How much? Last year, we were not able to gather for seven last words. Come on, hmm. that's right. Those of us who work in this facility have been on the front lines. We've been providing care for individuals with COVID and many other medical needs. Some of us may have experienced unemployment, may have been laid off or furloughed, Many people sheltered in place over the last year and have experienced depression. We have seen the numbers and know that we've lost over 500,000 lives in the U.S. due to COVID. And some of those have been our family and friends. I know that there may be some of us who have even battled COVID. We may have had to deal with the loss of taste, may have had some coughing, may have had fever, and may have even had fatigue. Mm. Many people have suffered more in this last year than they have suffered in their entire lives. And this Good Friday, we come to remember Jesus. And Jesus knew all about great suffering. Mm. We can look to Jesus as the example of what to do in times of suffering. 
What did Jesus do when he was in the garden of Gethsemane? He prayed. What did Jesus do when he hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? He prayed. And finally, here in this last word, what does Jesus do when he said, Father, and to your hands I commit my spirit? He prayed. We've got to go to God in prayer. Many of, many of us like to call on other people when we're down and out. We like to call on friends. We like to call on family members. But I'm so glad you have a support system. But we've got to learn how to call on God. Because God will give you a peace that passes all understanding. You may say, Chaplain Cleaver, I've been praying. And nothing is happening. I prayed for COVID to end. I prayed for my health to get better. I pray for my children to get off of drugs. I pray for financial stability. What do I do when I pray and my prayers have not been answered? For well, we can look to Jesus again. Jesus prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And God did not answer. But Jesus did not stop praying. He was arrested. He was tried in court. He was beaten. But Jesus did not stop praying. Because when we get to this text, we see that he prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We've got to give it to God. And when you've done all you can do, oh, yeah. we must do like Jesus did and put it in God's hands. Jesus had done all he was born to do. He did his part as he ministered to people, no matter what their social class or their ethnicity was. He healed the sick. He made the lame walk. He made the blind see. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. Yeah. He carried the cross. And they nailed him to the cross. Yeah. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They pierced him in his side. Yeah. And he hung on that cross for you and for me. Yeah. Then Jesus got to the point where he couldn't go on any further. So he placed his spirit in God's hands. Oh, yeah. The same hands that created the earth, sea, and sky. The same hand that created the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, the beasts in the fields. The same hand that created humans from the dust of the earth. The same hands that delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. The same hands that protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in the fiery furnace. The same hand that protected Daniel in that lion's den. When we're down and out, when we got, and when we're down and out, we've got to do like Jesus did and put it in God's hands. As I close, I'm reminded of my late grandmother. I have a grandmother who was very involved in raising me. My grandmother really loved the Lord. She would be home cooking oh, while we were in school. That's right, that's right. And while she was home cooking, she was listening to sermons on the radio. <laughs> and one day I came home from school stressed out. Mm. And I remember that day because my grandmother told me, I heard a preacher say, you've got to put your hands in the hands of the man. And I knew that if I put my hands in God's hands, that everything would be all right. Yeah, yeah. I've got to take my seat, yeah. but I can hear my grandmother saying, oh, yeah. Precious Lord, oh, yeah. take my hand, oh. lead me on, on. help me stand. I am tired, yeah. I am weak, yeah. I am worn, oh. but through the storm, oh. through the night, lead me on through the light. Yeah. Precious Lord, precious Lord. Precious Lord. Yeah. Take my hand oh, yeah. and lead me home.
this program? Were you there? Then he crucified my Lord. Join me, please. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? Were you Jesus, go in your peace. 